be with you. Loving God, we gather penitentially in your name to seek renewal. We gather joyfully in your name to worship you. We gather full of hope, seeking your help and guidance. And we gather because we love you and we want to worship you. May we worship with expectation, openness, receptiveness, and sincerity. In the name of Christ. Amen. And our opening hymn this morning is Before the Throne of God Above. I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Let us pray. O God, our loving Father in heaven, we confess that we have sinned against you, we have broken your commandments, we have often been selfish, and we have not loved you as we should. For these and all our sins, forgive us, we pray, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in His image to the praise and glory of His name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Your word is a lantern to my feet. O Lord, Your word is everlasting. Let us then receive the word of the Lord.
And our first reading is from 2 Samuel. We've been looking at David over the last few Sundays, and we're come now to this point where David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant to the city of David, to Jerusalem. After the death of King Saul and Jonathan in battle, David was first anointed king of Judah, then king of all the tribes of Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king. For the first seven and a half years of his reign, David ruled from Hebron. David then decided to take Jebus, and later called Jerusalem, which was held by the Jebusites as the new capital of his kingdom. Jerusalem on Mount Zion had a fortress that was so well defended the Jebusites boasted, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion and made Jerusalem the city of David. He started developing the land around the fortress, and the Lord was with him in all that he did. Hiram, king of Tyre, sent envoys to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. David knew that God had established his kingdom, and he wanted to make Jerusalem a place of worship too. The Ark of the Covenant had been at the house of Abinadab in Kerajiram for the last 92 years. And David wanted to bring it to Jerusalem and put it in the new tabernacle he had erected. The whole of Israel assembled at Kerath Jerem, and the ark of God was put on a new cart with Uzzah and Ohiah guiding it. They did not think it was important to obey God's instruction that the ark was only to be moved by the Levites. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God with songs and with harps and lyres and tambourines, cymbals and trumpets. When they came to the threshing floor of Kedon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark, because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and he struck him down, because he had put his hand on the ark. He died on the spot. David was afraid and asked, how can I ever bring the ark of God to me? The ark was taken to the house of Obed-Edom, the Giddite, where it stayed for the next three months. While the ark was at the house, the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his family. And then David decided to bring the ark to Jerusalem, but to do it the way God had instructed Moses that it should be moved. No one but the Levites may carry the ark of God, David announced. The Lord chose them to carry the ark and minister before him. When the Levites had carried the ark for six steps, David made sacrifices to God. David asked the Levites to choose musicians and make a joyful sound with lyres, harps, and cymbals. The musicians were led by Heman, Asaph, and Ethan. The Levites were clothed in white linen, as was David. Kenaniah was in charge of the choir, who led the singing. The people of Israel brought the ark to Jerusalem with shouts of joy and the sound of rams' horns, trumpets, cymbals, lyres, and harps. As the ark of the covenant was entered in Jerusalem, David's wife, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. When she saw King David dancing and celebrating, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings and blessed everyone in the name of the Lord. He gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the crowd. Then everyone returned home. When David went home to his wife Michal, she said, Is it right for the king of Israel to behave as any vulgar person would, in full view of the slave girls and servants. David replied, I was before the Lord, who chose me to rule Israel, and I will celebrate before him. And we pray that God will add his blessing to his word. And our appointed psalm for today is Psalm 24. 
The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it. For he has founded it upon the seas. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord. Such is the company of those who seek him. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Who is the King of glory? Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Who is this King of glory? Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our New Testament reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. And here we have the account of King Herod meeting uh, with Jesus. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the Baptizer has been raised from the dead. For this, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been tell telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter, Herodias, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? And she replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet, out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded John in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother, and when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Our next hymn is, I Will Sing the Mighty Power of God that made the mountains rise.
Our Heavenly Father, we now pray that You would come and continue to speak with us. We thank You for the words that we've read from Your truth. We pray, Lord, You will come and teach us the right way, the, the way that You desire that You are to be worshipped. Be with, Lord, those who are at home in their different homes this morning as they will listen uh, to this Word. We pray that You will bless them as well and feel part of the fellowship here. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, I don't have a license uh, for a TV in the rectory. Now, if you're thinking that's a scandal, uh, I don't have a TV there either, so it's okay. But sometimes when I have uh, my work done, I like to watch a film. And I googled last night YouTube free movies, and I came across a film I had never seen before uh, with Charles Bronson in it. And if you're interested in it, it's called Death Hunt. And it's based on a true story. And that's the sort of films I like. That's some basis on a, an event that happened in the past. And in 1931 in America, on the border with Alaska, this incident took place. I'm not going to tell you any more, but it's, a, it's an interesting film. And sometimes when you sit down to a, a, a film like that that you know nothing about, it takes a little while to get into it. It's different if you read the preview of a film. You sort of know where it's going and who's in it and things like that. When you come to God's Word, we've come across an amazing story about a girl called Micah, and she was Saul's daughter. And Micah is important because when David went out to fight Goliath, remember we looked at that a few Sundays ago, Saul made a promise that he would give his daughter's hand in marriage to whoever defeated Goliath, along with riches and untold wealth. It turns out when David did defeat Goliath, he didn't get the first girl, the oldest daughter, Merib. Instead, he got Micah. And it seemed that this relationship was really made in heaven because we're told that Micah loved David. And that's important because you might have thought, well, whoever is going to be the bride of David would be reluctant, and it would be like a forced marriage. But it turns out that Micah really loved David. And David, coming from a shepherding background, we're told he was very humble and felt that he wasn't worthy to get married to Saul's daughter. And Saul set him a challenge. If you go and kill a hundred Philistines, you'll be worthy of my daughter's hand in marriage. So off David went and killed two hundred Philistines. And David then came back and he felt, well, I feel better now about getting married to Micah. And it seemed as if things were going to work out for the young couple. David was a hero in Israel. He had defeated Goliath. And no doubt Micah probably was attracted to this young hero who was the, the talk of the country. And they got married. And things went uh, reasonably well, we believe, at the start. But then we're told that Micah's father, Saul, had a grudge against David. And Saul saw something in David that wasn't present in his life. And he saw that the people were really, really supportive of David. They, they made songs about it. David, uh, or Saul has killed his, his hundreds, but David has slain his thousands. Yes, Saul was important as king, but David seemed to capture the imagination of the nation of Israel. And Saul did not like this. And apparently Saul was prone to fits of depression. And one of the things that soothed his depression, David would come and play on his instruments, on his harp. And uh, these moods, these fits of depression would leave him. But every now and again, a fit of rage would come upon Saul, and he would look around for something to throw at David to kill him. And right throughout the early years of this marriage, it was very difficult for David and Micah. Eventually, 
David had to leave. He had to leave behind uh, the, the, the temple or the, 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 the palace where the king was. He had to leave behind Micah and flee for his life. And then Saul appears out of a fit of rage and anger against David. He marries Michael off to another man. So what started off promising turned very sour. David was on run for his life. Micah was at home, and Saul sees an opportunity to get at David again and marries Micah off to another man. Pretty bad start, you might think. Years later, David becomes king of Judah and then of Israel. Remember, we saw that last week. Saul is defeated in battle and takes his own life. And Jonathan is killed, uh, the brother of Micah. And the family line of, of Saul uh, dies out. The men folk die out. They're, they're all killed. When David becomes king, he remembers that he is still married to Micah and demands that she come back to him, leave her husband and come back to him. This was about 15 or 20 years after their marriage. And then we're told that an opportunity comes when David realizes, you know what, the Ark of the Covenant should really be in Jerusalem. Remember, he had been fixing it up and preparing it. He had defended its walls and built them up and wanted Jerusalem to be the center of the nation. And he said, the ark has been away for over 90 years. I want to bring it back. But they forget that the ark is a, a symbol of God's presence, and the ark is to be revered and treated with respect. And they forget this. And I remember Uzzah, who sees the ark swaying a bit, and he goes and reaches out and touches it, and he is slain right away. And then David remembers that the ark is precious. It is to be revered. And he's a bit afraid, and he leaves it at someone's house, and you've seen it, uh, the picture of it, and it's like parked in a garage for a little while. But we're told that the house that they left it at, Ebod, uh, Ebon, they left it there, and he was blessed then. And David then realizes, you know what? It's safe now to bring the ark to Jerusalem. And so there's great excitement. There's singing and dancing. There's celebration. We're told that David was this ecstatic. He was jumping around for joy. He was so excited that the ark was now coming to its place in Jerusalem that he had built. And the people all got involved in this. This was a momentous event. To describe it like uh, the queen coming into Donnacavy Church wouldn't be even near as important. This was the most important thing for David. He was someone who walked close with the Lord, realized the importance of the ark, and said, listen, we want this symbol in the center of Jerusalem, and we're going to worship God uh, here. There was great excitement. And then we're told, as the ark approached Jerusalem, someone was watching from an upstairs window. It was Micah. After all these years, they're reunited again. Has anything changed? Well, we're told in one of the verses that when she saw the king David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him. Husbands, if your wife despises you, that's a bad situation. And wives, if your husband despises you, it's not a good place to be. We hear a lot now about mental awareness or mental uh, problems. And very often when people go for counseling, and it's a good thing they do that, they're asked to talk about their feelings and share uh, how they feel about different things. They may start off with questions like this. 
What would make you happy? What things in your life give you joy? So it's an opportunity then for for conversation, and people then begin to say, well, yes, I feel happy when I'm with my family, or I feel happy when I see someone, a friend. And then they might be asked, well, what makes you sad? And then they'll think over maybe events that happened in their life, and they'll say, this event makes me really sad. I wonder what makes you feel annoyed. Well, I was telling the folk on bar this morning that when I, just before I went to, to bar church, I saw a white van on the road with the hazard lights on, and I thought, what has happened here? But as I got a bit closer, I realized that the van was moving slowly, and in front of the van were about 20 cyclists. And I don't know what you feel <laughs> when… <laughs> I'm sorry if you're a cyclist. I don't know what you feel when you come across cyclists, but I confess to you, and this is to my shame, I feel annoyed. I don't know why. I just know oh, they're, they're holding me back, or they're, they shouldn't be here. But they have every, but every right to be on the road as much as I have. I feel annoyed. When Michal looked at David dancing and celebrating, we're told that she despised him. This is a, a very strong word. It's more than being annoyed. She thought nothing of him, was basically what she was saying in her heart. She had no respect for him whatsoever. She despised him in her heart. Their relationship had got to a very low point. She had lost all respect. Why was it that when she saw David leaping and dancing and celebrating that she was so angered against him? She tries to tell David that it's because of the garments that he's wearing. Apparently, the garment that he had wore was a, a linen cloth, and uh, Micah thought that it was a bit obscene for the king to be wearing something like this. She thought his behavior wasn't of a king. She grew up, remember, in her father's palace, saw how he carried himself, saw how he behaved, and thought, King David you're not like a king at all. You're not behaving like my father did. And we're told that Micah despised him in her heart. What started off as a loving relationship, and we're told in God's Word that Micah even told lies on David's behalf. Remember when Saul's men came looking for him? Uh, they came to the bedroom, and Micah had had uh, told David to flee, and she put a, a statue in bed instead. And when the men came, they saw what looked like David, and off they went again. And then she came, they came back again, and Micah said, well, David threatened me. He, he threatened to kill me if uh, I said anything. So Micah obviously loved him at one point, but now things had changed incredibly. Maybe it was because the man that she had married again, she really loved him, and he loved her. Maybe she felt annoyed that David claimed her back as his, as his possession after many years. Something had changed and wasn't going to be fixed. She despised David. I wonder, was it because that she couldn't accept that David could love someone more than her. Here was David. He was full of excitement, full of joy, serving the Lord. For David, there was uh, one person in his life, and that was the Lord. And maybe Micah didn't like that. Maybe she felt that she should be number one. We're told that when David 
got back home. Micah came down, and she was furious uh, with David. She said to David, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. She was really making a mock of him and saying, listen, you are an utter disgrace today. And just imagine how David would have felt then. Here was someone. This was one of the high points in his life. He was on a high, coming back from bringing the ark to Jerusalem. And he meets Micah, and she, what's that expression, takes the rug from under his feet. She brings him down to earth. What a disgrace you are, David. That's no way for a king to behave, going around half naked in view of everybody there. But David has a reply for her. It was before the Lord. I was dancing and celebrating before the Lord. I wasn't concerned who was watching, who was taking note of my behavior. I was taken up in the moment of praise and adoration to God. And sometimes it's not easy praising God when others say, what on earth are you doing that for? There are people this morning who would probably laugh at us and say, why on earth do you go along to that old church? Why on earth do you go along and sit in wooden pews for an hour? Why do you listen to music that was written hundreds of years ago? Why do you listen to a book that was penned thousands of years ago? They will laugh at you and scorn you, like Micah did with David. But David had an answer. It was before the Lord. And that's our answer to people. Listen, I don't care what you say. I have come to worship my God with other people who worship my God. And then David says something about cutting back to Micah. He says, God chose me rather than your father. Sometimes when relationships break down, things are said that cannot be unsaid. I remember listening to someone who said about words that come out of our mouth. And the idea that these words go out and they can't be brought back again. And the writer said, not even the fastest galloping horse can retrieve them again. Once they're out, they're out. So David puts in his ten piece worth and says, God chose me rather than you, or rather than your father, or anyone from your house when he appointed me over the Lord's people. I will celebrate the Lord. I can do no other. That's what Martin Luther said, wasn't it, when he pinned those theses to the door at the start of the Reformation. He says, I, I, I can do this and I can do no other. And David says, what am I supposed to do? God wants me to worship him in spirit and in truth. I've been doing that. And how dare you? How dare you say that I shouldn't? And it's good to come to that point in our lives when we can say to other people, you know what? I don't care what you think. I'm going to worship God as he leads and guides me. This is the greatest service we can do on earth for God. We're going to spend eternity, remember, worshiping God. And surely we ought to begin here and now. And David went on to say, you know what, Micah, if you think this is bad, watch this space. I'm going to be even more undignified in your sight, worshiping God. I don't care what you think. I only care what God thinks. The last mention we get of Micah is this, in verse 23. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. 
David was happy enough that she was back as his wife. No one else was going to have her. But he wasn't going to have relations with her. Something was broken. Something was damaged that couldn't be fixed. What started off for Michael a promising adventure ended up a terrible mess. I can't help but feel there was something missing in Micah's life. She had no time for God. She should have been celebrating with David, but instead she was judging and despising him. I wonder this morning, have we got the right attitude to worship? It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. If God moves you to come to worship, then do that. Don't matter when you go into work tomorrow and people say to you, were you at that fuddy-duddy place yesterday morning as well? You answer. As David answered, it was before the Lord that he opened up my heart and he blessed me. And I don't care what you think. I will please the Lord and not you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We pray, gracious God, that we will learn lessons from Micah and David. We pray, Lord God, for the hardness of heart that Micah seemed to have, our lack of respect, not only for David, but for the King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you for David's attitude. Nothing else mattered to him. Didn't matter, if, didn't matter if it seemed crude and crass the way he worshipped. He knew that he was worshipping God in spirit and in truth. Help us to do that, Lord, in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. <clears throat> so we've got a song now for the children to join in as well. My God is so big so strong and so mighty, there's nothing that he cannot do. And then we sing that again. Thank you, Anne. trust in God the Father who made the world? Do you believe and trust in the Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed humanity? Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God? This is the faith of the church. Please be seated. Almighty and ever-living God, we ask you to hear the prayers we offer in faith for the peace that comes from God alone, for the unity of all peoples, and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the Church of Christ and for Bishop Ian, and for the whole people of God. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the nations of the world. We think of those nations where there's strife and battles and wars. 
We think of those countries where there's want and need. Think of those countries mentioned on our televisions and on our radios that are going through terrible times at the moment. We pray for our own government and all in authority. Let us pray to the Lord. And we pray for Fintana. We pray for its inhabitants. We pray for our neighbors and for our friends. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the good earth which God has given us and for the wisdom and will to conserve it. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, for the sick and suffering. Very mindful of Betty at this time. We pray for Patricia. Pray for Winston. We pray for Desi. Pray for Jean. We pray for all in any need. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and all who remember and care for them. Let us pray to the Lord. And let's just have a few moments now when you can pray for someone that you know needs help. Maybe someone in your family, someone in your circle of friends, a neighbor, someone who needs help at this time. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the dying and for those who mourn, for the faithful whom we entrust to the Lord in hope, as we look forward to the day when we share the fullness of the resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. And rejoicing in the communion of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another all our life to God. For yours is the majesty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And the colic for today. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us give thanks to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the love of our Father, the Maker of all, the Giver of all good things. Let us bless the Lord. For Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who lived and worked among us, let us bless the Lord. For his suffering and death on the cross and his resurrection to new life, let us bless the Lord. For his rule over all things and his presence in the world, let us bless the Lord. For the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, who teaches us and guides us, let us bless the Lord. For the grace of the Spirit and the work of the Church and the life of the world, let us bless the Lord. And our closing hymn this morning, Make Way, Make Way for Christ the King.
And so we go into the world to walk in God's light, to rejoice in God's love, and to reflect God's glory. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you all always. Amen. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.